Welcome to Going Deeper. My name is Marcy Sklove, and today my guest is Bruce Watson. Bruce is one of the recipients for the upcoming uh, 2019 Sammy Awards. You are getting a Centennial Award, which made me think of all these jokes like, ha ha, you're a hundred, that kind of thing. <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> which is not funny. Um, Bruce is a prolific writer. He has written four amazing nonfiction books and um, has an online magazine called The Attic, which we will be talking about. So welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And congratulations. It's kind of nice to finally be, you know, given some recognition in your own town where I'm thinking about the Amherst Bulletin mm -hmm. pieces that you did for mm -hmm. so many years and how you've really Well, I used to get a lot of recognition when I wrote 28 years. Uh, and I would be walking downtown with my little children when they were little, and yeah. I got a lot of it. People would stop me on the street. So that was wonderful. Thank you, Amherst and, uh, and Northampton later. So I got a lot of recognition. But this is for a different, um, the Sammy's sure. not for that. It's for something else. Yeah, yeah. So what did they tell you it was for? They told me it was about time. No, they told me that uh, I, uh, it was no coincidence. A year and a half ago, they approached me uh, with their 100th anniversary coming up. This is the Jones Library. Right. Of, uh, to write a 100th anniversary history of the Jones Library. Oh. And I initially thought, history of the library, what am I going to write about? Crime waves of, of overdue fees and mold, <laughs> the danger of mold. But in fact, uh, I thought about how much the Jones had meant to me. And mm -hmm. I've been here now for 30 years. And when I first got here, it was that old Jones Library that many people remember where you could just get lost in the labyrinth. It was wonderful. And I just fell in love with the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's continued over the years. And I've used it I, when my children were young. It was the place where you went for a break and story hour. And sure. later, I was as a freelance writer, I would be there almost every day writing. And I, so I, I thought, well, why not? And mm -hmm. I'm glad I did, because I found uh, by going upstairs into their special collections and yeah. uh, all, the, all the archives and treasures they have there, not just about Frost and Dickinson, but about themselves, yeah. that it's a fascinating place with a very interesting history. And now there are all sorts of histories of libraries. Susan Orlean has written a huh. history, uh, the library book, and some others. We're all story, sort of starting to come to the realization that this is, these libraries are these institutions that are holding our society together. They are the embodiment of the best in American life. Wow. Free information, um, sharing, people who are willing to help you, not to mention uh, open public spaces for mm -hmm. whoever needs that. So I'm glad, I, I tried to incorporate all of that into my book on the Jones Library, which is coming out in a few weeks when I think it'll be available at the Sammy's. Oh, that's great. It's also making me think about what this moment is in, in libraries because it's a big transitional time mm -hmm. with all different kinds of information and how to how how to kind of incorporate all that into the old the old space. Yeah, I got to trace all that. I mean, it starts out, um, you know, this library is unique. It, everybody seems to think, as I did when I first came here, oh, that was somebody's house and isn't mm -hmm. it nice? It never was a house. Wow. It was built to look like a house. Uh, that was the idea behind it that was really different than most other libraries. They didn't want a place where people just came and went, uh, got their books and left. They wanted, as one trustee said, uh, a, a place where, a hearth where Mother Amherst welcomes her children. Oh, I and, love that. And, um, <laughs> and so from the beginning, it was designed as a place like that with a lot of fireplaces and rugs, old rugs, and, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it has that hominess, and uh, that sort of set the tone that it's, that's continued for ever since. Hmm. Yeah. Good. Enough about the library, though, because okay. I want to hear more about you. Um, I wanted to start with the online uh, magazine that you have. I obviously just looked at it. I uh, didn't know about it before I was doing this interview. And what I'm so excited about is its tone and how positive and interesting and sometimes very funny so many different aspects of life, but not the drudgery, negative, political quagmire that mm -hmm. we're in right now. 
Well, it goes back to a little before the last election, okay. believe it or not. Uh, I was flying to Iowa to speak, and something about moving, something about entering the heartland, I suppose, made me think about what was about to happen. And even though a lot of us didn't think the election would turn out as it did, mm -hmm. it seemed to me that the ugliness of that election, which was not confined just to one man or one party, uh, the overall ugliness of the election had made us such a strident country that the history that I used to write for mm -hmm. Smithsonian and American Heritage was all but gone. The idea it was this, America can do no wrong, no America can do no right, mm -hmm. and in between there's this vast history of culture, literature, lore, poets, humorists, and some politicians mm -hmm. who have really created what I think is the spirit of the country, and they were not getting any attention, and I thought, well, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to start a website. I'd never done that before. Hmm. So I did this and that, and it started um, in January 20, 2017. And um, ever since, now it has, because that's more than two years, it has more than 100 articles, wow. uh, each one about 800 words in different categories. There's a category of history, there's a category of arts and literature, there's a category of women, humor, and a because I travel as much as I possibly can, there's a category called Attic on the Road. Yeah. And so uh, you can go through and just browse. You can see a new one uh, every week. There's a, cat there's a thing called I Hear America Singing, where I uh, just started that, but where I hmm. pick one of my favorite songs, put a link to the video. Oh, great. Another category called The Attic Window, which, because I can't do this alone, you can click on it and you go through the window and you're at a New York Times article or a museum ex That's exhibit. That's brilliant. And the tone finally came to be called True stories for a kinder, cooler America. Yeah. And that, I think, is what we need. I do, too. Um, I mean, yeah. I'm happy to, I'm fairly political, as everybody knows, and I have my strong opinions, but there are no politics in the, in the attic. Mm -hmm. I will not allow it. And um, I'm the only writer, so uh, it's easy to not, <laughs> not allow it. So this week's was on, oh, I can't even remember, and last week's, no, this, Last week was on uh, the Nanana Ice Classic, an ice lottery in, uh, in Yeah, that's Alaska. what I This week's I read. was on Ida Tarbell, the muckraker. I've done articles on the artist Jacob Lawrence or Jasper Johns, the artist Edna St. Vincent Millay, Kerouac, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, Langston yeah. Hughes. Uh, the Attic on the Road has gone, I've been around lately since I started The Attic. I've been to the Grand Coulee Dam and Cadillac Ranch in Texas and Harper's Ferry. And uh, so there's just, an embarrassment of uh, my own riches, so to speak, there on, yeah. online. Yeah, so that one that I read this week, maybe it's last week's, but the one about, uh, first it was the happiest cities, and then it was... Oh, those were lists. I, I decided everybody likes lists these days. But where's the, the photographs from all over, Attic on the Road? Did you take all those photographs? If it's an Attic on the Road piece, like at the Grand Coulee Dam or, or Harper's Ferry, those I took okay. with my little phone. Uh, but the web being what it is and the attic being not uh, in the crosshairs of any copyright, I, I okay. sort of feel like I can use a photo from sure. somewhere. And if someone wants to tell me to take it down, I will. But So the photos are generally not mine, but if, for the yeah. explicit travel pieces, Cadillac Ranch, I took those photos. Okay, okay. Well, I love it, and I think people should go to it, and we're going to put up the URL. It's okay. the attic... Dot space. Dot space. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm in the middle of reading Freedom Summer. Mm -hmm. We own our own copy, but I had some library mm -hmm. copies here. Uh, wow. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> that <laughs> describes the story. I hope we can get yeah. to that. This is a wow, too. It is a wow, them. yeah. Um, I've been lucky over the years. Um, I'm basically more a storyteller than a writer. I look yeah. for a story. I tried to be a fiction writer, and I was failed miserably. I wrote a lot, but uh, but I found you can tell, um, you can find, you don't have to make anything up in history to, mm -hmm. to find the right stories. And Freedom Summer, the story of uh, 1964 that many people thought they knew, mm -hmm. I even thought I knew it, uh, the three murders and wasn't that right. you know a tragedy and it's still a, a turning point in the civil rights movement but the story was really the day after those murders uh, which took place on the first day of Freedom Summer when 700 uh, college students had gone to Mississippi yeah. to help uh, register voters and things and the murders were clearly done to scare them away mm -hmm. and the story was that they stayed yeah. and the story is the rest of the summer when for seven weeks, 
no one even knew what happened to the men. They figured they'd disappeared, but mm. uh, I mean, they had disappeared. They figured they were gone, but nobody was certain, and they haunted the whole summer. And the whole nation paid attention to Mississippi because sure. of that. Yeah. And the inspiration that um, I found, and I think readers find in this story, of people really trying to make a difference and putting their lives, literally their mm. lives, on the line oh, yeah. to do it is remarkable. And I was lucky enough to find local people and uh, yeah. volunteers, they're mostly still alive, who told me their stories of, of terror, fear, restless nights, but also of getting to know a culture they'd never known mm -hmm. um, and uh, surviving and coming back with what we could only call PTSD now. Yeah, yeah. And it, was, it is indeed a remarkable story. I felt privileged to tell it. Yeah. I'm just curious about the logistics. Like, how many interviews? Well, it says in the back of the I think book. about 50. 50 interviews, mm -hmm. and all of the details that are fully footnoted, and mm -hmm. there's a long bi bibliography. Do you do all that research yourself? Do yeah, you I'm, hire? I'm, I don't have uh, you don't hire. Steve Ambrose. I don't <laughs> have people. I did, when I wrote a book on Sacco and Manzetti, yeah. a guy came forward and did some preliminary research for me. But other than that, I've always done it and prefer to do it if I, uh, if I can, if I was doing a World War II, I probably sure. wouldn't. But um, you have a finger on it, uh, uh, on the pulse, if you are doing it yourself. Right. It becomes a little obsessive, I'll admit. And then there's also, by the way, a whole trove of letters, both uh, in a wonderful book called Letters from Mississippi, hmm. and then also in various archives around the country, in Mississippi and in Wisconsin, huh. and uh, the University of Wisconsin. And I looked through as many of those as I possibly could, too. The letters sure. were one just wow. so heartfelt. Yeah. So, um, are, where are you from? Where were you born? Where are you from? <laughs> I was born, I think, proud, I should say this in the attic probably, because it's as American as apple pie. I was born in Peoria, Illinois. Huh. Uh, Peoria, where they used to say, will it play in Peoria? Um, but I didn't grow up there. I grew up in Southern California. Okay. Uh, Orange County, which is also about as American as apple pie, about right. eight miles from Disneyland. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to figure out how that, do you have a sense of how your early life influenced or informed this writing and the, the breadth of your interests? And um, I'm, I will credit my mother, who in another book I wrote about light and the history of light mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that I hope we may get a chance to talk about. Sure. I actually dedicated it to her. These other books I dedicated to teachers or to volunteers, but I dedicated that to her because she was, as I say in the dedication, interested in everything. Mm -hmm. She was a school teacher, she, uh, public school teacher. She raised four of us mm -hmm. on her own uh, after a divorce, and um, there was nothing that you could bring in uh, that she wouldn't be interested in. She would take me out at night to see the stars. Um, every She taught um, everything from elementary up into middle school. And in middle school, she taught uh, English, journalism, math, and art. Wow. She was a real Renaissance woman. Yeah. So I think that that interest and her love of books uh, came through somehow. Yeah. So that's a good segue to the, the book about light. Mm -hmm. well, go ahead and talk about that. <laughs> uh, well, my <laughs> most recent book was uh, a book called Light, A Radiant History from Creation to the Quantum Age. I wanted to call it light. I wanted to call it uh, Eternal, a biography of light, because mm. that's what it is. It's a biography of light. And it traces, um, this was way out of my league. I know, uh, it's so science-y. <laughs> well, it, it could have been just science-y. Uh -huh. And there have been, I discovered when I thought, of, uh, got the idea from reading an Einstein biography, mm. I wonder what if anyone ever done a history of light, <clears throat> that it had been done, but almost always by physicists. Yeah. And so they were primarily, uh, there was a history of optics. Mm -hmm. Well, not being a physicist uh, and interested as well in the literary aspects, I just thought, well, let's do, let's do this from how my mother would do it, interested in yeah. everything. Yeah. So it starts with creation myths, and I was reading um, Joseph Campbell and that type of creation myth, where is light? And then it goes to scripture, what, does the, the, mm -hmm. what did the Hindu scripture say? Beautiful, beautiful uh, mm. hymns to light in the Rig mm. Veda. Everybody knows, of course, Genesis and let there be light and mm -hmm. Buddhist light, et cetera. Moving on chronologically into um, um, Greeks, and, and now you start to get into the science. Uh, mm -hmm. Greeks and what a light actually is, and then the whole uh, way that the Quran treats light, and then the oh, Islamic yeah. scientists, and if you're yeah. still with me, folks, moving <laughs> on into some philosophy, and finally into the, um, everything from art history and the major artists of light, uh, which I narrowed, I could have, every artist is an artist of sure. light, but I picked Rembrandt, Caravaggio, and Turner, and then the Impressionists, wow. and finally, 
with Newton and then on into the 20th century we come to the mastery of light and uh, with physics and, and relativity and uh, the quantum light that we're using on our on our uh, quantum quantum optics that we're using on everything every screen item everything we do hmm. making this an age of light I'm exhausted yeah. just talking about it yeah and, um, it's a lot anyway a lot. it was so much fun Wow. So much fun to do. I hope I made it comprehensible in all different how, ways. How long did that book take you to write? About two years. Uh huh. And what happens to you when you're in between projects? I go nuts. I, I wonder, yeah. <laughs> I get, I, everything I say, hmm, I wonder if anybody's written a book about cups. You know, <laughs> just everything becomes a possibility in, until yeah. I can narrow it down. Yeah. And, um, I'm, I'm glad to have the attic now because if I think of something, that just seems like, oh, I could spend it. I'm interested in telling that story. I can do it right away. I don't have to sell it. I just do it. Wow. Um, I enjoy it. It's up there, and then I can move on. And maybe one of those 800 word things will turn into another book maybe. project at mm -hmm. some point. They all have been, most of them have been books by somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> so you reached over for Bread and Roses. Mm -hmm. It's still my favorite book. It was, uh, it was not my first book, which was about erector sets. Uh, and the, yeah, we I missed, missed that, that one, one, didn't we? Uh, and <laughs> that was sort of a foot in the door. Somebody saw an article, an agent saw an article in Smithsonian and said, I think that'd be a book. And I thought, Wow. Yeah. Well, Wait a second. An agent came to you and yes, said they, this could that's be the a dream, book. Isn't it? Oh, that is the dream. <laughs> so you don't turn your back on that dream. So I said, sure. Give it a go. So I wrote up a proposal. I wrote it in the Jones Library, by the way. Oh. And they sold it, and I wrote it, and I hope I did a good job. But that opened the door to more, and they must have been rather surprised when I, for my next book, I proposed doing a story on a knockdown, drag out, bloody, famous yeah. labor strike in Lawrence in 1912, known as the Bread and Roses Strike. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it remains my favorite, not be just because. It's the most amazing story. Hmm. The story, uh, it should be a movie. Uh, I'm surprised it hasn't been because it unfolded like a novel from Dickens. I didn't have to, not only did I have to make anything up, but I didn't have to compress time or expand huh. it. Every week there was something. There was a thread, uh, there was a the walkout and the fire hoses and all that. And then the chaos. And then a, an organizer came to town. And then they charged him with planning dynamite, which turned out to be a complete uh, mm -hmm. fabrication. And then in the most famous incident, the, the family sent their children out of town to families in New York and in Vermont be, to be get out of, to, out of harm's way yeah. and that got a lot of publicity and then there was a woman killed and then there was congressional hearings and a murder trial at the end wow. it, it was stunning Wow and uh, and a story where it was so much fun to tell and and uh, it had not been told there hadn't been a book and about how it. did you come upon the subject well, I worked, uh, I was an elementary teacher during the time, elementary school teacher during the time that I was uh, writing novels and, mm -hmm. um, back in the 80s. And the last place I worked was Lawrence. Okay. And I uh, wow. was bilingual by then because I'd been in the Peace Corps in Costa Rica hmm. and got a job teaching in a bilingual classroom. Oh. And um, Lawrence, I was teaching on the south end of town. Most people in the, know Lawrence as the place they drive by on 495 yeah. and they see those mills. <laughs> but um, I didn't see them that much until one day I went into town and I was just, hmm. I'd, I'm from the West Coast, I'd never seen a mill town and this is the mill town. Huh. And they're all there still and they're a thousand or two thousand feet long in some cases and they're six stories high and you just know that was a, that town has a story to tell. Mm -hmm. So I heard about the, the strike, heard about things like that and thought about it later. Wow. There's a really beautiful scene in a film called Pride. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it, you should check out that film. It's about this strike in Wales. Mm. And oh, I do know that one. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. and the, there, in, in, Engl in London, mm -hmm. there were a group of gays mm -hmm. who wanted yeah. to be in solidarity. Yeah, and right. there's this beautiful scene where um, the workers have you know, a gathering. The gay people come to the gathering. Mm. They're all a little afraid of them and all this kind of stuff. But they sing that song. They sing the song, Red and Roses. And it's so moving. It's so mm -hmm. beautiful. Uh, Judy Collins is the most famous yeah. version of it. But um, there's also a movie called Bread and Roses uh, with um, Adrian, uh, Adrian Bro 
the, is that how you say his name? And it's about a strike in, uh, even though it has this name, it's not about this strike. It's about a janitor strike in, uh, a service people strike in L.A. in the early 2000s. Mm. It's a good movie, but at the very mm. end, he gives up and he talks about the origins of the phrase in 1912 and Lawrence. Hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay, so just briefly, we can't leave out Sacco and Vanzetti. No. <laughs> <laughs> that would be not good. Well, Sacco and Manzetti sort of emerged as a sequel to Bread and Roses. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the next book. It was very, came along very quickly. Uh, at the very end of Bread and Roses, as I was researching, I came across, uh, you know, I look everywhere I can, and uh, there was an overlap there. Sacco had actually been, as a shoe worker in, uh, from Italy, he had actually gone to Lawrence uh, during the strike and seen people speak and, uh, and helped raise money for the cause. Mm -hmm. So that drew me to a book on them and then of course in that case I couldn't say there were no books on Sacco Manzetti. There are like 60 books on Sacco wow. Manzetti. But what I was able to do, I got thoroughly involved in it. There hadn't been one in a long time. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of, were they guilty, were they innocent? What, for those who don't know, Sacco and Manzetti were two uh, Italian immigrants and anarchists Proclaim, uh, proud anarchists who were accused almost 100 years ago now, 100 years ago next year, hmm. of uh, a payroll robbery murder, brutal gunning down in, in Braintree, Massachusetts. And it led to a seven, uh, trial in which they were convicted despite all sorts of doubt and uh, seven years of appeal, uh, during which time they became the most famous men in the world, I am convinced. Mm. They, wow. uh, there were marches on the day that they were to be executed, and finally were, there were marches in every capital in the world, Johannesburg, Tokyo, Sydney, wow. all over Europe. Not so much in America, curiously, sure. but some. And so all of the literature on it had devolved into, were they guilty, were they innocent, mm -hmm. were they guilty, were they innocent? And, um, and there is reason where you can argue both sides. Uh, my book, I decided I'm not going to say what I think. Mm -hmm. Let the reader decide. I'd have a hard time reading it and thinking they were completely uh, that they were that they were totally guilty. I mean, there's yeah. just all so so much doubt. But it was also interesting because uh, I speak some Italian and I was able to read their letters in Italian, hmm. uh, which had not been used very often, and uh, found found the letters. I was going back and forth, back and forth to the Boston Public Library where there's stacks and stacks of letters wow. by them and by their lawyers and using yeah. a lot of stuff that they hadn't that hadn't been used before in spite of all these books and so uh, I had again a, uh, it was this is not an inspiring story uh, other than the nobility of the people who mm. uh, who fought for them there were some many older socialite women who befriended them became like second mothers to them when they were in jail wow. there was a lawyer their second lawyer who corporate lawyer who had no everything to lose by taking mm. the case and the appeals and he did of course, it has a rather sad ending, but it was it was yeah. a remarkable story. Yeah. Wow. And uh, word on the streets, you have a new book you're working on. Well, sort of. <laughs> I hadn't heard it on the street yet. Yeah, yeah. New York Times, I heard it first, <laughs> yeah, but I've, then I heard it on the streets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, somebody should put it in the attic. Um, <laughs> yes, and I'm finishing it up now, and it's a coming out, I hope, next year. Uh, from uh, it's a young adult book, and I was asked to write it as a young adult book, um, and it's about uh, w race being such a hot button issue mm. now, and I'm sure forever as it should be. Yeah. Uh, we are opening up and turning over all sorts of rocks, and uh, discovering on Freedom Summer was one of those. Sure. But I mean, yeah. uh, many people were shocked to read what Mississippi was like in 1964, and I was very careful to talk about all the progress that Mississippi made. But uh, still, we are, we are in that sort of mood. And um, yeah. I wanted to uh, not whitewash anything, no pun intended, mm. but to call attention to the fact that, that there, was, there have been over the years people who have fought for racial equality, even when it wasn't popular. So my book is on uh, a group of anthropologists. Uh, Margaret Mead is the most famous, mm -hmm. but at the center of it is her teacher, a man named Franz Boas, who basically was the founder of anthropology in America. He came from Germany. He started anthropology at Columbia. All of his students within 40 years were all over America teaching his, his paradigms, his mm -hmm. teaching, which was basically that si the scientific racism of the time, which statistically, quote unquote, proved white superiority, proved 
that the primitive peoples, quote unquote, and the savages, quote unquote, were never going to amount to anything, didn't have anything worth studying. That was the opposite of everything Boaz and his mm. students believed. Mm -hmm. And they waged a, quite a heroic battle in print, in classrooms, and uh, in public schools to uh, restore the dignity of all people. Mm. And so it's a, uh, it won't make you feel great about racism in America. Mm. Uh, it certainly will not erase that or to change anything. But no, it does it. show yeah. uh, that it has not necessarily just been on one side. I, in the process, I read a, a really good book called A History of White People by Nell Irwin Painter, mm. the uh, historian at uh, Princeton. And she just goes through scathing, it's hard to read, all the history of racism, and, and Emer all your favorites, Emerson, Jefferson, of course, all these others, and just the racist statements. But there's one ch chapter called Franz Boas, Dissenter. Mm. And she just says exactly what I'm saying, that yeah, he wasn't perfect, but he did this, he waged this battle, wow. and people should know about it. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. So that is pretty inspiring, given the age group also. Yeah, I, I'm, I've never written for that age group. So. Yeah, so how does that work? Like, do you have to kind of be careful of your vocabulary? That, or and yeah, and, and it's shorter. And, slower uh, moving, yeah, maybe? Or? Uh, more yeah. anecdotal, more stories, mm -hmm. really. And, and it's hard with anthropology, because that's not uh, an easy discipline to, to uh, under any circumstances, to bring to even to high school level. Exactly. And so, um, so it is. I'm not going deeply into anthropology. Right, it's more right. of a social activist study. That's great. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I would like to remind everyone to please come to the Sammy Awards. They're on uh, April 25th, mm -hmm. 6 p.m., I think. Yeah, Converse Hall, you have to get tickets. Converse Hall mm -hmm. tickets, that's the whole idea. You'll mm -hmm. buy tickets. It's a fundraiser for the Jones system. Right. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you, Marcy. Really appreciate very it. Very nice. Yeah, when I was a little boy sitting on my mama's knee, she said, son, let me tell you about that.